Welcome, and thank you for watching. My name is Dale Sadler, and I am the minister of the Birdwell Chapel Church of Christ in Cottontown, Tennessee. I'm so glad you decided to join us. This will be my last lesson in this setting, since we will be returning to our regular meeting time and place for live worship on June 14th. I can't wait to see you. Most information will be coming out later this week about our return. But for now, on June 14th, we will still have our online Bible class and our live worship will start at 10.30 a.m. For now, there will be no Sunday night or Wednesday night services and there will be no Sunday school except for the live discussion uh, with Jim and myself. Also, we will still make devotional material available as we have been these last couple of months. The deacons have met and have outlined protocols for meeting that you will receive later this week. We hope to put everyone at ease who decides to come. If you feel at all uneasy about meeting though, and especially if you are in a high risk group, do not feel as though you must attend the live services. Our system here has been heavily upgraded and you can watch live with us from your home. So my sermons won't be on YouTube until later. You actually will have to be uh, at home uh, watching or someplace watching uh, live as we broadcast that morning service beginning at 1030. Be sure to visit our website, find us on Facebook, and also on Instagram. Will you pray with me, please? Our Father in Heaven, we're so thankful for the improvements that have been coming around from the COVID-19, and I pray that you will be with us at the Birdwell Chapel Church of Christ and other congregations of the Lord's Church as they continue to open and reestablish their meeting places and their meeting services. And Father, may we all work to seek You in all that we do. And may this, Father, bring us back to You a bit closer as we return back to something, Father, that looks like normal. We pray that You'll continue to be with us as we strive to serve You in whatever circumstances we might find ourselves in. And be with us now, Father, as we reflect and uh, concentrate on those things that You have set forth in Your Word to instruct us in our way of living. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. One of the things Scripture is good at doing, especially when you look at its historic context, is addressing the sins of the day. People listened because what Jesus and the disciples were saying was relevant to them. Today it is very easy to simply preach a sermon and say something like, sin is bad, God is good, y'all have a nice day. But what does this do? Absolutely nothing. Paul the Apostle warned against this type of preaching in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by His appearing and His kingdom. Timothy, as I am today, was charged to preach the Word. How was he to do this? In all seasons. He was to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. He was to tell all of his listeners what they were doing wrong. He was to be ready in season and out of season. Boy, you better be ready even when you're not. And you better be patient while you're doing it. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The people will want teachers for themselves, Timothy, not for God. They will want teachers who will tickle their ears. Teachers who will make them feel good. They will not want the truth. But Timothy, you better do the hard things. The things people won't want to hear because you are an evangelist. I am an evangelist and today it's just as important for ministers of the Gospel 
to call sin out for what it is. Particularly when you see it night after night on the news. However, I will not be speaking against the riots and looting. But what I will be speaking to you about today is racism. I've struggled to write this sermon because I didn't know exactly what to say. I have a lot to say. But this is a difficult topic. This is one of those seasons that Paul told Timothy about and he said, hey, this is going to be difficult. This time in our country is difficult for all of us. Particularly our ministers who need to be on the front lines of the change of the social justice that, that needs to occur in regards to black men, black women being killed unjustly. Being killed at all. We all know that racism is wrong. God made mankind in His image, Genesis chapter 1. God made one race, and that is the human race, Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. God doesn't play favorites and neither should we. Galatians 2.6 in the NIV says, God does not judge by external appearance. And love is not racist. 1 Corinthians 13 speaks to this. And if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20. Finally, Jesus came to save everyone. He makes no distinction. For there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3 and verse 29. So we know that racism is wrong, yet here we are. What was your reaction when you heard of the death of George Floyd? Were you sad because he was one of God's children? Or did you think he was probably doing something wrong? A friend of mine shared this on Facebook the other day. And I'd like to share it with you. Some people keep saying it's horrible that an innocent black man was killed, but destroying property has to stop. Try saying it this way. It's horrible that property is being destroyed, but killing innocent black men has to stop. I would agree. I don't claim to have all the answers to what's going on in our world, but I hope you will find today's message beneficial. When discussing difficult topics, I find it helpful to simply ask questions and then look for the answers in Scripture and other places that will bring people together, regardless of background. So, here's our first question for this morning. Why the outrage? People who look like me ask this question, and it's a valid one. Especially when you don't understand another man's point of view. For racism to end, people from different communities must have empathy for one another. One man's perception is his reality. And you show your neighbor love when you try to understand his life experience, not discount it. For the black community, the death of one of their own is a setback. Have we come a long way in our country? Yes, but when things like what happened to George Floyd become a regular event, it is more than an accident in their eyes. And to my eyes, it may be more than just bad police training. At the least, it serves as a reminder of a very difficult time in our nation's history. A time that the parents grandparents, great-grandparents, and of course other ancestors in the black community went through not too long ago during a time when the killing of a black man was actually applauded in some groups. Many in the white community get distracted by the rioting and looting. I watched as my beloved Nashville was attacked. 
its buildings that represent so much history, became nothing more than another person's object to destroy. Well, the looting outrages us all. No one who wants to live peacefully on this earth wants to see looting and rioting happening in the streets. Well, there's outrage in the black community because people don't get it. You often hear the chant, Black Lives Matter. This is often met with the rebuttal of, well, all lives matter. Yep, they do. That's obvious. But when you say this to an African American, you are minimizing their experience. You are also minimizing what they are trying to get across because to them it seems as though black lives don't matter. What is their experience, by the way? Do you know? Their experience is one of oppression in a world that they feel does not want them. Do we? Of course. But imagine though you're at work or at church and no one speaks to you. No one invites you over for dinner. No one includes you in anything. You feel unappreciated and unwanted. That's how many African Americans feel their entire lives. Do they have it better than their ancestors? Yes, but there are small things along the way that make their entire existence difficult. Things that should not be happening. There's also outrage over the idea that he could be killed, George Floyd could be killed, and there be no consequences for those involved. I love and appreciate our police officers. There's a lot more good of them than there are bad, I'll tell you that. But may I submit that the protests aren't about only the actions of those officers and of what led to the death of George Floyd, but rather the protests are speaking out against the apathy that sometimes comes with horrible events like these. Events that happen way too much simply because a man is black. I may look like a mafia hitman, but if you see me in an Italian restaurant, I'll be more than happy to share my calzone with you. Also, before anyone tries to pin me to a crime, they better have more proof than the color of my skin. Ahmaud Aubrey was out for a run when he was confronted and subsequently killed by two white men earlier this year. Why? Because he matched the description of someone who had been stealing things in the area. What does this mean? It means he matched the skin color. It means that Ahmaud was black. Ahmaud was killed on February 23rd. No arrests were made until May. I think this had a lot to do with the fact that one of the perpetrators was a former police officer. Again, there are good police officers out there, but I am well aware of those bad cops who protect other bad cops when they do bad things. It happens. There is outrage over the death of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey. Based on my experience, things don't change until people get mad. May the outrage we see be a turning point for our country. And may you have some anger as well as you see your fellow man being treated in a way that he does not deserve. Why the outrage? I, I hope you can see that. Next, why the blindness? Why do some people see racism while others don't. There are many alive today that lived in an era when the dividing lines of race were very well defined. Not just by laws, but by social rules and expectations. I found such a sentiment from a preacher in an article he wrote in 1941. In the article, he chastised white church members for enthusiastically Shaking the hands of black preachers. Maybe the black preacher was better than the preachers they had heard. They must have gone crazy, the preacher would note in his article. I'm sorry, but I believe that Romans 10 and verse 15 says, How beautiful 
are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. I shall refrain from mentioning the late preacher's name because his sentiment was pervasive among all churches in those days, among all white churches, so he is not alone in his sin. Also, racism during the early to mid-20th century was the status quo for the day. Both white and black preachers had to navigate the system they were living in regardless of their opinion of it. Wes Crawford, minister for the Glenwood Church of Christ in Tyler, Texas, wrote the book Shattering the Illusion, How African American Churches of Christ Move from Segregation to Independence. Mr. Crawford specifically mentions how the late Marshall Keeble had to work in his day and time. Crawford points to two different Marshall Keebles, a public one and a private one. Keeble, when he was in public, would follow the guidelines set forth by racism out of necessity. He navigated the social rules of the day. Why? Because he had a priority to raise money for the Nashville Christian Institute a preaching school. Keeble knew his mission of training future preachers and raising money for them was more important than his personal feelings on race relations. So he navigated those times, right or wrong. He did what was expected of him so he could get support to train preachers for today. However, there was also a private Marshall Keeble. This version hated racism. And obviously, looked forward to the day when segregation would be a thing of the past. Keeble had to navigate racism very carefully so he could accomplish the long-term goal of training preachers and hope that some sweet day those same preachers would not have to endure the ills of segregation. We are living today with the ripple effects of those events. We are not segregated in our church because if you are black, you cannot come in here, but we are segregated because of the mistakes of long ago. Our African American brethren at the West Eastland Church of Christ, just 20 minutes down the road, are a light in their community. But may we never say they can't come into our building. May our actions never imply, may our words never suggest that they are not welcome, or for that matter, any member of the African American community. May they feel just as welcome as anyone who needs the redeeming power of Jesus Christ who loves all mankind. For me to love my neighbor, I must understand how our worlds connect. If you don't understand this, then you may be blind. The Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 was someone who shouldn't have helped the injured man on the road according to the culture of the day. He should have passed on by like the priest and like the Levite, the men who actually should have helped and didn't. How should we be like the Good Samaritan to those of a different race? We should see the hurt they have and listen to them. If nothing else, we should listen and validate their feelings. You hurt your African American friends and people of other races when you tell them they shouldn't feel a certain way, or that the world is not that bad, because their perception is different than yours, their life experiences are different. So listen to them, and if nothing else, think of this, what if it was your child? Would you not be angry? Be thankful for your blessings, but work to understand those who are not like you, and your eyes will be open. So, you must recognize the anger that is out there about racism, and you must see your own blindness so that you can be what Christ called you to be. Because what our world needs is more people like Jesus. We all know that change needs to happen, but what change is that? We all, regardless of color, need to respect and love one another. Our main goal on earth as Christians is to preach the love of Jesus and anything that even looks like racism should not be a part of that plan. Does white privilege exist? Some say no, because we all have the same opportunities, which to a degree is true. All of my classmates all through school that were African American 
studied with the same teachers and used the same books as I did. We were not segregated. Well, you see, racism doesn't have to be full blanket policies like that kept us segregated long ago. But racism can come in other forms, like obstacles on a trail. And these obstacles affect some, while others, they do not. And it is because of the color of their skin. Here's some numbers to consider from an article by Jeff Nesbitt of U.S. News and World Report. In the workplace, black college graduates are twice as likely as whites to struggle to find jobs. The jobless rate for blacks has been double that of whites for decades. A study even found that people with black sounding names had to send out 50% more job applications than people with white sounding names just to get a call back. Black people stay in prison up to 20% longer than white people, serving time for essentially similar crimes. They also get much harsher sentences. Black people are 38% more likely to be sentenced to death than white people for the same crimes. Now, I am not a master of race relations. But what I do know is that for change to occur, the white community must play a major role. So what can we do as a church and what can you do as an individual? First, as individuals, you can recognize racism in your own life. And maybe you don't consider yourself a racist. Maybe you have many friends that you love and appreciate who are of a different background than you. That's great. But I would recommend respecting those differences, acknowledging them. Many people brag that they are colorblind when it comes to seeing other people, that they don't see different races, that they treat everyone the same. While this is good in some ways, in other ways, it misses the point of recognizing and appreciating someone for their ancestry. See people of different races as humans, as individuals, not simply as a stereotype. Next, as a church, we can make issues like racism a priority. While Jesus charged us to spread the gospel, a large part of this gospel is to reach those who society has cast aside and mistreated. Isn't this what Jesus did when He spoke to the sinners? Jesus saw those who were marginalized for one reason or another, and He sought them so that He could show them a love that no one else had. May we show that love to all people based on the example of Jesus Christ. Because church, if we are about the mission of Jesus, fighting racism should be a part of that. Racism is evil, pure and simple. Will it go away completely? I don't think so. Because mankind has always been and will always be sinful. Even though it can't be eliminated, it can be eliminated in the hearts of good people who may not see it in themselves yet. We are all God's children and we all must look to Christ's redeeming blood. I hope you're a Christian. I hope you've been baptized for the remission of your sins. And I hope you love your fellow man regardless of where he or she is from. Jesus came to change your heart for the better. Love your fellow man to the degree that Christ loved you enough to die for you. Scripture teaches us that we must be baptized to be added to the body of Christ. Acts chapter 2. Contact us at the Birdwell Chapel Church of Christ and let us help you start a new life that involves loving your fellow man, whoever he may be. Will you pray with me please? Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this time that you've blessed us with to be in devotion to you. I pray for Father for our country. I pray that those, Father, whose hearts are hard and who do not love their fellow man, I pray that their hearts will be softened. And I pray, Father, that all of those who heard this morning's lesson, whenever they may hear it, will think seriously about how they treat their fellow man and will, Father, make that decision to become a child of Yours. I pray for George Floyd's family. I pray for... Ahmaud Aubrey's family, 
Help them, Father, to find peace. And may good come from this terrible event. And others, Father, just like it. For there are so many even been killed this year that we've not mentioned. May we, Father, think of those people as Your children, as those that You created and loved. And may we, Father, consider our own hearts and change in, in, in the way, Father, that You would have us and whatever change that might be made to be necessary at this time. But Father, I pray for the hearts of those watching they might consider the racism or the bias that's in their life. And we'll change that for you, for their fellow man, so that they might be a light in this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to read from Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if this is the Christ of God, His chosen one. The soldiers also mocked Him, coming up to Him, offering Him sour wine, and saying, If you are King of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above Him, This is the King of the Jews. Let us pray. Our Father in Heaven, we're grateful for Jesus' body that was broken on the cross at Calvary for our sins. We're grateful for this bread that represents that body. May we, Father, partake of it in a worthy manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Continuing with verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the blood of Jesus that was spilt for us on that day. Thank you, Father, for its redeeming power. And may we all, Father, partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that blood that was shed on that day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Open my heart. Be sure to share things happening at Birdwell Chapel on your social media platforms. We have this YouTube channel and a podcast. It's very easy to subscribe to each of these. I miss you very much, and may God bless.